Hi, my name is Bill. I'm the pastor of Fellowship Bible Church in Hillsboro, New Jersey. And normally on Thanksgiving Eve, we at Fellowship Bible Church would be gathering together to sing songs of thanks, to give testimony for the things that God has done in our lives, and to have a uh, short Bible study together, remembering all that God has done for us that we might be thankful. This year, because of COVID, we won't be able to have the service that we normally have. So we're just meeting online. I'm posting a brief sermon here on YouTube so that we can remember to be grateful even in this very difficult year of 2020. And so we're simply going to have a word of prayer and then just jump into our brief message tonight. Uh, let's pray together. Father, we are grateful. Father, even in a difficult year when many things have not gone the way that we're accustomed to or that we want them to, we know that you are with us and we are thankful for that. Father, we are we have gratitude even in these hard and these difficult times. Father, it's not easy for us. There's certainly been times that we have been discouraged, that we have felt alone. Father, there are times that we just want to see things go back to the way they were. But Father, we thank you that you are in control of all things. We thank you that our future is certain because of the work Jesus did in dying for us and in rising again to new life on the third day. Father, as we come to your word, encourage that gratitude in our hearts. Help us not to be complaining. Help us not to be upset about things that we can't control. But let us be thankful to you for every good thing you have given us in Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, if you've been with us over the last few Sundays, you know that we just concluded a series entitled, Thank You, A Graduate Guide to Gratitude. In one sermon from that series, we looked at how to be thankful even when it doesn't seem there's much to be thankful for. And tomorrow is the rare Thanksgiving where many of us might not feel all that thankful. Uh, for many of us, tomorrow will be unlike any Thanksgiving that we have ever celebrated, and I don't mean that in a good way. Uh, all of us have Thanksgiving customs and traditions that are going by the wayside because of COVID-19. Uh, many of us won't be gathering with family like we are used to. We won't be traveling to relatives or they won't be traveling to us. Uh, certain dishes might be missing from the table because the relative that usually makes them won't be there. Watching the football game might not be the same without our cousin. The parade won't be the same without the balloons. The Thanksgiving we will have tomorrow is not the Thanksgiving that we are used to. And frankly, it's not the Thanksgiving that we want. Because Thanksgiving will be so disappointing for so many of us, there might be a temptation to skip the day altogether. We might be tempted to take the day off from all of our Thanksgiving traditions. Yeah, maybe we won't eat the turkey dinner if we're the only one there to eat it. And maybe we won't watch football if we have to watch it alone. We'll skip the broadcast of the parade since it can't possibly live up to past years. And worst of all, we might decide to skip the gratitude. Since the day is so different, we might decide to not even tell God all the things that we are thankful for. I think 2020 brings us the temptation to skip Thanksgiving. We imagine that we'll be thankful in 2021 again when everything goes back to normal. But now it is just hard to give gratitude. If that is your thought, then I want to challenge you to change your thinking. The right response to 2020 is not to skip Thanksgiving. The right response to 2020 is to make every day Thanksgiving. That's the first big idea from our sermon tonight. Make sure you don't miss this. Don't respond to 2020 by skipping Thanksgiving. Respond to 2020 by making every day Thanksgiving. Now, some of you out there, you're uncertain about my suggestion. Some of you think making every day Thanksgiving is not the best of ideas. You know, some of you don't like football all that much, and so you think three games, nine hours of football every day, that might be a little much. Others of you are counting calories in your head. You're thinking about day after day of stuffing, mashed potatoes, and pie, thinking that might not be good for your weight loss or for your cholesterol count. You can't imagine what the scale would look like if you ate Thanksgiving every day. And still others are thinking Thanksgiving every day would mean way too much time with Uncle Joe. I mean, you love Uncle Joe, but a few times a year is enough. You couldn't take the jokes and the political opinions every day. Well, when I say make every day Thanksgiving, I obviously don't mean make every day a traditional Thanksgiving. While we probably shouldn't watch nine hours of football a day or eat a full Thanksgiving meal every day, we need to become regular in our practice of gratitude. 
Gratitude to God is something that we need to express each and every day. You see, gratitude is the emotion that makes difficult times easier. Gratitude is the response that helps us measure our trials and our difficulties by the right standard. Now, the idea of having Thanksgiving every day doesn't come from me. It actually comes from the Apostle Paul. If anyone in the Bible could relate to our struggles in 2020, it was the Apostle Paul. For those of you who don't know, the Apostle Paul was the greatest missionary in church history. Led by the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote some two-thirds of our New Testament. Paul was a very important figure in the history of Christianity and in the growth of the church. And you might think that a religious, God-honoring man would have had an easy life. You think you might have think that God would have blessed Paul with uh, ease and comfort because of his great faith and commitment. However, those who know the story of Paul know that the truth is the exact opposite. Despite his faithfulness to God, Paul did not have an easy life. In fact, Paul's life was quite difficult and quite painful. Paul outlined some of the hardships that he faced in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. Now, this isn't our passage tonight, but let me read 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28 as a way of reminding us some of what the Apostle Paul endured in his lifetime. Paul writes, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Beside everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. You think Paul would have understood what we're going through in 2020? Actually, Paul's experience makes 2020 look like a church picnic. If you ask me which I would choose, 2020 or Paul's life, I'm going for 2020 every time. Paul knew what it was like to endure difficult times. And so Paul was able to give great advice for difficult times. He was able to tell first century Christians and us how to endure the difficult days. And we are going to see that a secret to holding up in tough times is gratitude. If you have a Bible or a Bible app nearby, open up to Philippians chapter 4. The letter to Philippians is written by Paul. He wrote it to a church that he had founded. The church of Philippi was a church that had endured difficult times because of their faith in Jesus. And Philippi was actually one of the places where Paul had been imprisoned and whipped. When Paul wrote about his list of sufferings in 2 Corinthians, his experience in Philippi probably came to mind. The Philippian Christians faced a great deal of persecution, poverty, and suffering because of Jesus. Yet look at what Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, the Philippians were facing persecution and suffering. And what's a typical response to persecution and suffering? Well, a typical response to persecution and suffering is anxiety. When the future is uncertain, when we recognize that the future is out of our control, what do we do? We worry. And what does Paul tell the Philippians and us about our worried response? He says, do not be anxious about anything. Paul tells us that even in hard times, we shouldn't worry. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that Paul's advice is almost impossible to follow. I mean, honestly, if you're going to tell me not to worry, you might as well tell me not to breathe. Anxiety does not feel like something I have control over. To me, worry feels more like a reflex than like a conscious decision. You know what I mean. Something stressful pops up in my life and what seems to automatically happen? What automatically happens is that I worry. When stressful circumstances arise, I don't have an internal debate. I don't argue with myself, you know, should I worry or should I not worry here? Worry doesn't feel like it comes from the conscious part of myself. And I don't think I'm alone here. I think almost all of you have had the same experience with worry. 
To us, a command not to worry almost makes no sense. We don't feel like anxiety is something we control, can control. And so if Paul is going to tell us not to be anxious, he better also tell us how that is possible. Thankfully, Paul does give us a strategy for managing and defeating anxiety. Look again at verse 6. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. And then Paul describes how we work towards this goal. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And so Paul says we manage anxiety by prayer. In particular, we manage anxiety by presenting our problems and our difficulties to God. So Paul says if you face a difficult circumstance, don't be anxious. Instead, bring it in prayer to God, asking him to help you. Now again, I sort of want to push back against Paul's advice here. Because in particular, I want to ask the question, does praying really help manage anxiety? You see, I've actually had the experience where prayer helps increase anxiety. I've actually had times where praying makes me more nervous about a situation. Have you ever had that experience? You sit down to pray about something that's really stressing you out. You ask God for help, outlining all the particulars of the difficulty you're facing. And as you outline all the particulars of the difficulty, what happens? As you talk about your problem, it grows bigger and bigger. Outlining the problem to God makes it seem even worse than you first imagined. And so soon, instead of talking to God, you're in your own head trying to figure out by yourself how to solve the dilemma. Now, verse 7 says that if you pray, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. But sometimes it seems like praying doesn't lead to peace. Sometimes it seems like praying magnifies the problem and makes the situation worse. And so we want to ask Paul, well, Paul, how does presenting our prayers and requests lead to peace? And how would Paul respond to us? Paul would say, uh, you missed something. Paul would say, I didn't just say to present your prayers and petitions. There's another very important piece of my advice that you're overlooking. And so we go back to Philippians 4, 6, looking for what we are missing and what do we see? We see two words that we missed on the first read. Philippians 4, 6 says, But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Paul tells us that if we want to know God's peace, we have to make every day thanksgiving. You see, apparently giving gratitude is the key to finding peace. We've all done to present our petitions and request things and missed out on peace, but that's because we've forgotten to be grateful. If we want to have peace and contentment in every situation, we need to learn to be thankful. And so gratitude is the key to patiently enduring tough times. Now, as I read Philippians 4, 6, I have another question. My question is, why is gratitude so important? You know, we are met with these difficult circumstances of 2020. And what are we tempted to do? We're tempted to skip Thanksgiving. When I say we're tempted to skip Thanksgiving, again, I'm not referring to skipping the turkey or skipping the football. I'm referring to skipping the gratitude. This year, we would prefer to whine, complain, and feel sorry for ourselves rather to be grateful to God for all that he's done in the past, is doing in the present, and will do in the future. Complaining and whining are the opposite of gratitude. Even if we pray to God in Jesus, those prayers will not bring us peace when they are born from a complaining spirit. Peace comes when we present our requests to God in a spirit of gratitude. To deal with the challenges of 2020, we need to be grateful every day. And as I read Paul, I wonder, what is the miraculous power of gratitude? Why is it that gratitude to God is an avenue of experiencing his peace? Why do we need to be grateful, especially in light of trying circumstances? Again, in 2020, we're just tempted to skip Thanksgiving. But Paul says this is the exact opposite of what we need to do. Instead, we need to be grateful every day to deal with our trying circumstances. If we are going to cope with 2020, we need to make every day Thanksgiving. So what is the power behind our Thanksgiving to God? Well, I think the power of Thanksgiving can be put this way. Thanksgiving brings us God's peace because Thanksgiving reminds us that our problems are small and that our God is big. Let me say that again, because I really want you to get this. If you're going to take anything away from the sermon you're listening to, don't miss this. Thanksgiving brings us God's peace, because Thanksgiving reminds us that our problems are small and that our God is big. Now, I have to be honest, I don't know that Paul explicitly makes this point in Philippians chapter 4. 
you know, Paul doesn't write in Philippians 4.8, Thanksgiving brings us God's peace because Thanksgiving reminds us that our problems are small and that our God is big. Those words aren't found in the text. But those words are an implication of what Paul has written. And those words are supported by other passages of Scripture. And I think I can demonstrate to you from elsewhere in the Bible that Thanksgiving brings us God's peace because Thanksgiving reminds us our problems are small and that our God is big. So I can show you, for example, that Thanksgiving reminds us, like I said, our problems are small and our God is big. Now, let me be clear about something. When I say our problems are small, I'm not trying to minimize your suffering. I know the situations of many in our church. There are people in our church who are going through some very, very difficult uh, situations. There are people who have lost loved ones. There are people suffering uh, from physical pain due to illness or injury. There are people who are lonely each and every day. The pain and suffering of those situations is very real. And I would never try to minimize the burden that you are sustaining. What I'm trying to say is that your burden will seem less overwhelming when you learn to be grateful to God for his past blessings. Your burden seems less overwhelming when you remember to thank God for what he has promised you in your future in Jesus. When you are grateful, you are reminded that God has handled more difficult situations in the past. You're reminded that God has provided you with blessings for your future. One a passage of scripture that demonstrates the power of gratitude over the size of our problems is Psalm 136. Now, Psalm 136 is this weird sort of hybrid psalm. If you ever heard Psalm 136 before, you will never forget that you have heard it. In Psalm 136, the same phrase repeats over and over again. Matter of fact, 26 times the psalmist used the very same words. And so Psalm 136 is this unusual mix of Thanksgiving psalm and history lesson. Psalm 136 calls the people of Israel to thanks. But the thanks is given for things that happened a long time before the psalm was written. In Psalm 136, Israel is not thanking God for much that happened during their own lifetime. So again, if you have a Bible, Bible out nearby, open up to Psalm 136 and follow as I read. Now, normally when I read Psalm 136, I have the congregation read the repeated line while I read the rest of the psalm. So typically we would read the psalm responsively. I think that's how the psalm actually was originally designed to be used. I don't think, though, that a responsive reading works very well over YouTube. So bear with me as I read the psalm and its repeated line. And don't just focus on the repetition because that's what you're going to do. You're going to hear the repeated line and get bored. Don't just focus on the repetition. Focus on what comes between the repeated lines. Psalm 136 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, his love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them, his love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder, his love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it, his love endures forever but swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. His love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, his love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, his love endures forever. And killed mighty kings, his love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, his love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, his love endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance, his love endures forever. An inheritance to his servant Israel, his love endures forever. He remembered us in our lowest state, his love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies, his love endures forever. He gives food to every creature, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, his love endures forever. You probably got the big idea. You know, clearly Psalm 136 wants us to know that God's love endures forever. But the psalmist doesn't just want us to know that God's love endures forever. He wants us to celebrate that fact. At the beginning of the psalm, we are told three times to give thanks. Three times we are told that thanks is to be offered because God's love endures forever. 
And the remaining verses of the psalm prove that point. The remaining verses demonstrate how God's love has endured through Israel's history and indeed through human history. Only verse 25 really focuses on what is going on in the psalmist's own day. The rest of the verses look back to history, most of which occurred hundreds of years before the psalmist was born. You know, reading the psalm, you might wonder, well, why is the psalmist looking to the past? Why is he being thankful for things that occurred hundreds of years ago that he didn't even experience? Well, the answer is found in the setting of the psalm. You see, most of our psalms were written by David. David was the second king of Israel. So most of our psalms come from early in Israel's history during the early years of Israel's formation. Remember that Israel consisted of 12 tribes, and these tribes were only sort of loosely joined together as a nation until the times of Saul and David. Politically speaking, unification happened under David and then Solomon. But Psalm 136 doesn't come from that time early in Israel's history. Most scholars believe that Psalm 136 comes from a later time, hundreds of years after David. Most scholars believe that Psalm 136 was written after Israel had returned from exile in Babylon. Now, why would Israel need to know that God loves, God's love endures after they had returned from exile? Well, the answer is that life after exile was hard. When Israel came back from Babylon to Jerusalem, they had a hard time rebuilding their city, their temple, and their society. The glory of nation, the nation was gone, and life in Israel was very tenuous. It was very difficult. In spite of the return, the people of Israel wondered if God had rejected them forever. After the return from the exile, the people of Israel are more prone to complaining than to gratitude. How would they cope with this difficult situation? Well, the psalmist called on Israel to be grateful by remembering the past. Thanksgiving would show them that their problems weren't as big as they seemed. As we said, Israel had some big problems after exile. Jerusalem's walls had been torn down, leaving the city unprotected. Uh, setting those stones back in place was heavy work without modern machinery. The temple was in ruins. The people had no way to truly worship God because the building was a wreck and the priesthood had not yet been reestablished. Also, the people of Israel didn't know God's law. They were choosing not to obey it. This could lead to another disaster where Israel was sent into exile again because of sin. Life was very, very hard. Yet the psalmist encourages Israel to be grateful. He sees gratitude as their way of navigating through the tough times. And when you can thankfully remember what God has done in the past, it gives you confidence for the present and the future. Yes, Israel had some massive problems, but the size of those problems diminished as Israel gratefully remembered what God had done for them in the past. I mean, according to verses 4 through 9, Israel's God was the God who had created the world. According to verses 10 through 22, Israel's God was the God who led their ancestors out of Egypt through the Red Sea, defeating the mightiest army on earth, Pharaoh's army. God also helped Israel defeat other powerful nations as they entered the promised land. Verses 23 through 24 remind the Israelites that God had led them out of exile. You see, gratitude reminds us of what God has already done. And as we recall God's help in the past, the size of our problems lessens. As we are grateful for the past things God has done for us, we realize that there is no problem beyond God's reach. Gratitude gives us hope for the present and for the future, giving us peace. Thankfulness diminishes our problems by reminding us of the greatness of God. Gratitude magnifies God's power, reminding us of who he truly is. But gratitude not only reminds us of the magnitude of God's power, it also reminds us of the magnitude of God's love. Thankfulness is not just a recitation of the marvelous things that have happened. Thankfulness is actually a record and concern of God's love for us. Now, in 2020, in these difficult circumstances, many of us might be asking, God, where are you? With the difficulties of this year, we might feel that God has betrayed or abandoned us. Expressing gratitude to God is one of the ways that we remember that he has consistently loved and cared for us. Thankfulness lets us see the true pattern in God's dealings with us. Thankfulness lets us see the hardships are exceptions. As we express gratitude, we learn to see the constancy of God's care and protection. That's why one of the most important spiritual disciplines is grace. You know what I mean by grace? In this case, I mean saying grace. You, do you give thanks before meals? 
I hope that's a habit that many of us engage in. When I was in Indiana, I had a coworker who would make fun of me because I prayed before each meal. I wouldn't pray aloud, but I would close my eyes for a few seconds and thank God silently for the food. I guess I could have skipped it. The Bible doesn't explicitly say to give thanks before every meal. But the discipline of saying thank you to God before your meals is a good one. Your thankfulness to God affirms that God loves you and provides for you. Each time you give thanks before a meal, you're reminding yourself that God is big and that his power and love in your life have been constant. He's big not only in terms of power, he's big in terms of love. Every time you say grace, you're reminding yourself that his love endures forever. And so in 2020, many of us want to skip Thanksgiving. Missing a football game or a parade isn't a big deal. You can make it to 2021 even without a turkey dinner. But don't give up on the true meaning of Thanksgiving. We need to celebrate Thanksgiving every day. Thanksgiving brings us God's peace because Thanksgiving reminds us that our problems are small and that our God is big. And so maybe you won't have family at your house tomorrow. Uh, maybe you won't have football games or a parade or a turkey dinner. You can let all of those traditions go, but don't forget to be grateful. And so tomorrow, even if all the traditions are gone, spend 10 to 15 minutes just talking to God, telling him what it is that you are thankful for. And don't just do that tomorrow. Keep doing that every day thereafter. Say grace for your meals. Give thanks for the parking spot you got at the busy grocery store. Find small mercies to thank God for. Pray every day. Give God your prayers and petitions. But don't forget to be thankful too. You see, Thanksgiving is exactly what we need to get us through 2020. So don't let the absence of trimmings keep you from the presence of thanks. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we are grateful. And Father, we have to admit that many times in the moment we tend not to gratitude, but we tend toward complaining or whining or dissatisfaction with the things that are happening in our lives. But Father, as we look back and we see where we've been and the journey that you've taken us on, Father, we know that we have a lot to be thankful for. We're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for all of your provision for us. And so Father, help us to remember to be grateful that we might be able to put our problems in the right perspective and that we might be able to remember the great God that you are and all that you have done for us in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.